As an industrial water treater, you have to do so much. You have to know about so many things. Chemistry, physics, environmental, electrical, and the list goes on. But did you ever think that list should include cyber protection? Who's got time for that? Well, hackers have plenty of time to find your vulnerabilities and hold your valuable information hostage. 43% of all cyber attacks happen to small businesses. Small businesses are not prepared to defend against cyber attacks. The cyber threat protection experts at Reiner Consulting Group have been helping water treatment companies with strategies to protect their valuable data. Here's the thing about Reiner Consulting Group. They understand what water treatment companies need to defend against these attacks. From training to software, Reiner Consulting Group is your one-stop shop for protecting your valuable data. After all, where would you be without your data? Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash cyber to find out more. That's scalinguph2o.com forward slash cyber. Don't wait before it's too late. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, your host for the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And Nation, how awesome was it? So many of us participated in the global 6K. So many of us told the story that we are so lucky here in the United States where water just comes out of the faucet. We never have to worry about it not being there. We hardly ever have to worry about it not being clean and not everybody gets to enjoy that. We ran 6Ks or we walked 6Ks or however you did it. And we had so much fun. We did some hashtags. We shared so many items and we came together as a community to bring awareness to this cause. Folks, we are industrial water traders and there are so many people out there that just don't have access to clean drinking water. So I hope you had a great time in the Global 6K. We're gonna make sure that we promote this next year as well. So if you didn't do it, don't worry, you'll have an opportunity to participate next year. But if you didn't do it, or if you did do it, and now you want to do more, you do have an opportunity. Each child has the ability to have a sponsorship where you can work directly with Team World Vision. They have a program where you can sponsor a child each and every month. To find out more information about that, go to our show notes page at scalinguph2o.com. We'll send you a link right over to Team World Vision. Nation, thank you for participating in the Global 6K. Here's a couple of other things you might want to mark on your calendar. The American Water Works Association is having their ACE conference two years after the last one they had. They're finally back in person. So June 12th through 15th, that's going to be in San Antonio, Texas. If you want to learn more about that, that will be on our show notes page. ASHRAE is having their annual conference in Toronto, Canada. And you can find out more about that on our show notes page as well. By the way, that's going to be June 25th through 29th. So you can stay up to date on what's going on. Always check out our show notes pages so you can find something that interests you. And that's a super easy way for you to boost what you're doing day to day, get you in touch with other people so you can expand your network and make sure that you can answer questions and grow in your area of water treatment. Speaking of growing in water treatment, here is another installment of Thinking on Water with James. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James, the segment where we don't give you the answers, we give you the topics and questions for you to think about, drop by drop. Now let's get to it. In this week's episode, we're thinking about how oxygen is mechanically removed in a deaerator. What properties of water and oxygen are involved? which law predicts the solubility of oxygen? What does temperature have to do with it? 
What about pressure? How does the deaerator design facilitate oxygen removal? What can happen or change about a deaerator to reduce oxygen removal efficiency? Why is venting important? Why is mechanical removal of oxygen recommended before the second step of chemically scavenging oxygen? Take this week to think about deaerators and how they mechanically remove oxygen. Be sure to follow hashtag TOW22 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O to share your thoughts on each week's Thinking on Water. I'm James McDonald, and I look forward to learning more from you. Scout Up Nation, a lot of you know me through the Association of Water Technologies, and you know me because I've taught you something in the technical training class, or I've taught you something in the sales class, or I've taught you something in the fundamentals and applications class. I do a lot of teaching for the Association of Water Technologies because I love teaching. I love to give back to this amazing industry. And there you go, right there, the best of both worlds. I'm doing something I love to do, and I have a great reason to do that. Well, most likely, you have gotten something from me. How I explain something is from a tool that I received from somebody else. Somebody taught me something that I shared with you. Somebody gave me an illustration that painted a picture that allowed us to have a conversation, to have a discussion around something particular that just brought it to life. And most likely, if that was around biofilm, it came from Montana State University, the Center for Biofilm Engineering. My lab partner today is Dr. Paul Sturman of Montana State University, the Center for Biofilm Engineering. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. Good to be here. I can't wait to talk about everybody's favorite topic, biofilm. All right. Well, uh, it's my favorite topic, but uh, I'm not quite so sure it's everyone's favorite, but uh, thank you for that. Before we get started, do you mind introducing yourself to the Scaling Up Nation? No, absolutely. Uh, uh, Name's Paul Sturman. I have a PhD in environmental engineering, uh, but you know, in my day-to-day work, I'm much more of an industrial microbiologist. I manage the industrial interface here at the Center for Biofilm Engineering, and I've held this position for about two decades now, so quite a long time. Uh, From a time when most of our industry support came from oil companies and water treatment companies uh, to the present time when we see support from a really wide variety of industry, consumer products manufacturers, specialty chemical companies, healthcare-related companies, testing laboratories, uh, even some U.S. government agencies. So we're very interdisciplinary in this regard, and it turns out that I think our center, which has been in in existence for quite a long time, was kind of in the right place at the right time when biofilms really exploded on on the scene of industry as well as medicine. We're going to talk a lot about what your center does, but before we do, if you were explaining biofilm to somebody that has no idea what it is, how would you explain it? Well, biofilm is a community of microorganisms, and and this can be bacteria or algae or fungi, and and often it's all three mixed together. And and this community adheres to a surface, and it's embedded within an extracellular polymer matrix, which is produced by the microorganisms themselves. So biofilm forms on virtually every surface that is in contact with a fluid that has a water phase. And this water phase can be, can be quite small as, and not the main part of the fluid, but biofilm, of course, needs water to grow, as all organisms do. So biofilm is the reason that rocks in a stream are slippery and slimy to the touch. Biofilm is the cause of dental plaque. And biofilm forms even in purified water systems, including potable water mains and piping. And a, a very important aspect of biofilm is, it, is its ability to protect microorganisms from antimicrobials, such as chlorine in drinking water or antibiotics in the human body. And this protection stems from the polymer matrix that the biofilm produces. So antimicrobials often can't effectively penetrate this matrix, even at concentrations that are lethal to free-floating cells. And this is really why biofilms are such a concern. 
here in the industrial water treatment industry, we're really concerned with biofilm for a couple of reasons. One, it's an insulator, and now we can efficiently get heat from where we don't want it to where it needs to go. And there's also some pathogenic issues that happen. So I want to talk about those things, but uh, I want to introduce what Montana State University does and specifically the Center for Biofilm Engineering. What are you guys doing and how are you giving us more information so we can do our jobs better? We're a, a graduated National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center which means that we had uh, an 11-year run of NSF funding. And this was a huge grant at the time. And and this ran from 1991 until 2001. And so quite a long time ago was the largest grant that Montana State University had ever received at the time. And after that 11-year run from the National Science Foundation, you are uh, officially a graduated center, which means that you've got to be self-sufficient at that point from that point forward. And it's my understanding that we are one of the most successful uh, post-graduation engineering research centers in the United States. And there there are many of these, dozens. And and so what we do and, and why we have been so successful is that we understand the biofilm problems that exist in industry and we seek to solve them. We do both fundamental research as well as very applied research in trying to solve those problems, whether they are in an industrial water system or in a healthcare-related environment or even in bioremediation and biofilms growing in soil and groundwater. We are involved with that as well. So this, this interdisciplinary aspect of what we do has been really important to our success because we involve faculty and graduate students from about 10 different academic departments here, all the engineering departments, cell biology, microbiology, chemistry, organic chemistry, mathematics, all these people impact what we do. And and so we we are able to perhaps solve problems from an engineering perspective that wouldn't be solvable strictly from a microbiology perspective or, or vice versa. So if there was a student and they were graduating, let's say they had a biology or a chemistry degree, What would attract them to do higher education in your department? I think what would attract them to it is if they were involved at all with industry and understood the importance of biofilms to industry, that would be a really compelling feature. And and it isn't just industry. I'd say probably about a little more than half of our graduates go on to work in industry, about the other probably 40% or so go to work in academia. This is probably a little skewed from many academic degrees because uh, most, I think most people graduate with a PhD and, and say, well, I'm going to go into academia. But, but our PhD graduates are split much more in favor of industry than they are academia. And one of the reasons is that these students receive uh, quite a bit of exposure to industry and they see that working on industrial problems is maybe a little different than they had expected. And by that, I mean that these problems can be really compelling and interesting in their own right. And, and so I, I think that's maybe a surprise to a lot of students. Many of the listeners of this podcast work on cooling towers and making sure that they're as efficient as they can and also that they are as safe as they can be. Are cooling towers something that your department is looking at? Yeah, absolutely. In many ways, cooling systems were one of the original reasons that biofilms were studied. And this goes way back to the early 1980s and looking at heat transfer resistance and the fact that as as biofilm builds up in a in a heat exchanger or a cooling tower, you get a loss of heat transfer efficiency. And this in the case of a heat exchanger can can reduce the flow within the heat exchanger, obviously reduces the efficiency. In the case of a cooling tower, it might actually collapse the packing media if it grows thick enough uh, within that media. And so, again, this was one of the original areas of study that that we have worked on here at the the Biofilm Center. And and recently, we've developed a reactor system, which is just a laboratory biofilm growth chamber that emulates a cooling tower. It's got the unsaturated portion. It's got the media within it has a recirculation system involved with it as well. 
And so what we seek to do with that reactor system is to be able to scale down an actual cooling tower to something that would be relevant to a laboratory bench situation while keeping many of the important aspects of that actual field system. And so this is something that I think we're really good at here as an engineering research center. We think about things in engineering terms, flow dynamics, how bacteria get their food, how they grow, and we seek to quantify these things. And, And that's one of the things that I think differentiates us from many just straight, perhaps microbiology investigations of biofilms is that we really do seek to quantify both the the aspects of growth as well as the efficacies of treatment. How will industry see some of the benefits from the reactor that you're studying? Well, hopefully we can can look at uh, developing ways to either effectively administer antimicrobials or perhaps add antimicrobials together for synergistic effect. I mean, it's really about how to control biofilm within a system. And and many people come to me and say, I have a biofilm problem and I want to get rid of it. I want it gone. I want to eradicate the biofilm. (laughs) And I have to say, well, eradication is probably not a realistic goal. A more realistic goal is, is control that involves continuous or periodic treatment. And that periodic treatment is usually pretty darn frequent <laughs> because depending on the system, biofilm grows back very rapidly. And it's important to maintain control of the system if you're going to maintain control of the biofilm. That's a conversation that we have to have with our customers quite frequently, specifically around Legionella. And people say, I don't want Legionella in my system. Make sure it never grows there. Of course, we know it's constantly coming into the system. And people have the wrong goal where they think zero Legionella is what they're trying to get to. How do we apply what you just said to Legionella? Well, I think it's important to look at how Legionella grows in these systems. And and it doesn't grow by itself, right? It's part of the biofilm. And the more complex the biofilm is, generally speaking, the easier it is for Legionella to grow. And and particularly if you have the presence of of higher organisms like the protozoan host that Legionella likes to multiply within, if there are those organisms present, then controlling Legionella becomes even more difficult. And so as you said, zero Legionella, it's fine to state that as a goal, but I think we have to recognize that it's perhaps not a realistic outcome. Minimizing Legionella certainly is a possibility and can be done. I think it's important to understand that minimizing the biofilm that in general will tend to minimize Legionella. In in these open field systems like a cooling tower, and when I use the word field, I just mean like a full-scale system, biofilm doesn't grow in pure culture. It, it, It grows with a whole bunch of different stuff all growing together. I subscribe to what I call the theory of bacterial ubiquity, meaning that everything is everywhere and what can grow will grow. And we see that Legionella grows very well in water systems uh, and in in cooling towers, and it grows better in systems that aren't well controlled, let's say. Is Legionella something that you're studying? We do study Legionella. I wouldn't say that it's something that we have studied a great deal. There are probably other researchers around the U.S. and the world that have done more work with Legionella than we have. I think our, our piece of this is, is really looking at how Legionella grows within biofilm systems and how the presence of other microorganisms contributes to the recalcitrance of Legionella in these systems. Somebody in the type of water treatment that I practice will try to figure out what is the best microbicide to put in a cooling system to keep the biofilm at bay as best we can. What does your center do to help with that issue? Yeah, we we do a lot of work with looking at different antimicrobials in different systems. And this can be anything from the oxidizing biocides that go into many industrial systems to the uh, the non-oxidizers that are used in like the oil field uh, in the subsurface, places where oxidizers just are inappropriate to use. Both biocides offer some advantages and disadvantages. And so 
the type of system that's being used really helps to determine the type of antimicrobial that might be used within it. And, and our piece of this is to, to look at, at how biofilms grow and the effect of these different antimicrobials on the biofilm and really to quantify that either through looking at, at actual numbers of bacterial cells on a surface, looking at how biofilms might be killed versus biofilm removal, which are two really separate phenomenon. You can kill all the organisms in a biofilm, but leave the biofilm intact. Some antimicrobials are better at removing than others. Some combinations of antimicrobials are better at both killing and removal. So it's important to really target the antimicrobial to the system that is being disinfected. In an effort to try to clean up a poorly fouled system, somebody will put some sort of microbicide in there, and then a lot of foaming will take place. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And then somebody might even put some defoamer in. Does that affect how the microbicide interacts with the biofilm? Well, in general, the foamers are a good thing, especially in an unsaturated system like a cooling tower. It's important to get the antimicrobial into contact with the biofilm. And this can be a challenge in, in many systems, not just cooling towers, but in a variety of different systems. So this, this issue of, of access to the biofilm for the antimicrobial is really important to consider. And another thing to consider is the geometry of the system that's being treated. Systems that have really complex geometry, that have a lot of dead legs and, and other areas that biofilm can hide from the antimicrobial, they are much harder to disinfect than systems that are designed with biofilm in mind. And we're doing our best to try to educate the mechanical engineers that are designing these systems with bacteria in mind. But up until, you know, maybe 10 years ago, that just wasn't a consideration. So a lot of legacy systems suffer from the fact that they're not easy to clean. Yeah. How do you get flow to a dead leg? Uh, you, you, you don't. <laughs> I think the way you handle a dead leg is that you either make it not a dead leg by flowing or you close it off. If somebody fed a surfactant before they fed a microbicide, would that affect its effectiveness on the biofilm? It generally can, yes. Uh, this is something that uh, is a, a very well-established treatment strategy for biofilms, is to, to try to open up the biofilm and make it a little more penetrable to the antimicrobial. And a surfactant does a good job at that. In some cases, even uh, enzymes have been used to try to break up the biofilm matrix that, that sticks the bacteria to the surface. So anything that might help access the biofilm from the standpoint of the antimicrobial is generally going to make that a more effective treatment. There's lots of mysticism and folklore in our industry, and I've heard people say that you feed microbicides in the morning or you feed them in the evening, and it all has different effects on the biofilm. Is that true? <laughs> That's a new one to me. I've never heard of any diurnal kind of uh, strategy to, to, to biofilm treating. I suppose if you had a photosynthetic organism that was, you know, had an activity difference in day versus night, you might see some effect there. But there again, uh, yeah, that one, that, that would have to be proven to me. Thought I'd ask the professional. We were talking about cooling towers. Let's shift over to potable water. We're going to more efficient systems in all of our infrastructure, and we're slowing down the flow in all of our piping, which is allowing more biofilm to grow. My question is, you know, around the laminar effect of water, is that why we're having this issue? And, and maybe we even need to explain what we're talking about to our audience here. Sure. Yeah. So this is a huge issue right now with, with water conservation efforts and the mandating of low flow fixtures. The potential for biofilm growth is really expanded within these systems. There's two reasons for this. One is that the fluid shear that a flowing system in parts will help to drive the, the disinfectant into the biofilm to, in some regard. And, and that disinfectant in potable systems here in the U.S. anyway is overwhelmingly either chlorine or chloramine. The other issue with low flow systems is also around this disinfectant, but it deals with 
the disappearance of the disinfectant in really low flow systems. The disinfectant is added typically at the water treatment plant. And so it has a distance, the water has a distance to travel to the, the point of use after that disinfectant is added. And, and the entire time that disinfectant is in contact with that water, it's disappearing, essentially. It's doing its job by attacking the bacteria and other organics within that system. A low flow system, what you're going to do is extend that period of time. So the water is, is older by the time it gets to the place of use. Therefore, it may have significantly less disinfectant residual in it, which would lead to, to more biofilm accumulation. So this is going to be an issue as we move forward in, in this industry uh, because water scarcity is not going away. And so we're going to have to figure out how to maintain water quality within these lower flow systems because they're the future and whether we like it or not. It's uh, somewhat counterintuitive or maybe surprising to some that the answer to uh, a biofilm that's been in a low flow system that has grown up is to flush the system out, which of course means you're going to be wasting water in the process. But that's, that's the way you get more disinfected residual to a biofilm. I've seen hospitals where they used to put sinks in every location to make it easy for people to wash, that they're minimizing that now because those sinks weren't getting any flow through them. What are some design changes that you've seen that people are trying to do to minimize this issue? Yeah, so particularly the issue with hospitals is really important because nosocomial infections are hugely important. And the people who are in hospitals are generally have, let's say, more challenged immune systems than those outside of hospitals. So a hospital needs to be really careful about bacteria growing in their system. And so they've got recirculating systems oftentimes or, or should. And even the placement of fixtures is really important, like not putting the sink right next to the toilet is often a bad idea in a hospital or, you know, a, a toilet needs to be away from, at least in an enclosed room, perhaps from where the sink is located. And there have been studies done where looking at, at tracing the movement of particular strains of microorganisms from the waste system in a hospital to the potable water system in a hospital. And that happens through aerosolization from the toilet to places within the sink, which could then influence the the, when the water from the sink is turned on. So these are really issues that, that we haven't thought about in the past very much, but really need to think about now for nosocomial infections. Speaking about low flow, a lot of people are putting variable frequency drives on their cooling system pumps. What should we be doing with that? Should we advise our clients that if we're minimizing the amount of flow into that system, we're not able to treat it as effectively. How should that be taken into consideration? Yeah, I think it's the same. It's really an analogous situation to what we're talking about with potable water because the disinfectant comes with the water, right? It, it's, it's dissolved in the water and the disinfectant kind of disappears from the water at a particular rate that uh, we need to take into consideration. If there's less water flowing to the biofilm, there's less disinfectant flowing to the biofilm as well. And shutting down a system for a period of time is, is not, a, not an effective way to maintain control over the biofilm. So in a perfect world, we're trying to reduce energy consumption. We're trying to reduce water consumption. How do we do those things and make sure that biofilm isn't growing everywhere? It's a huge challenge and one that has, I, I don't have an answer to that question because I, I don't believe there yet exists a good answer to how you pick a point within these, these kind of competing goals, right? I mean, you want to save water, you want to save energy, but you don't want biofilm to grow. There's a set point there at which you can control the biofilm and yet minimize water use, but it may not be as far down on the, the water minimization as people want it to be. I'm curious, what are some of the things that you guys are looking at to try to solve that question? We are looking at the effects of water age on biofilm growth. That's one of the areas that we've been investigating because water age really deals with the disappearance of this disinfectant residual. 
So that would be probably the area that I'd say is we've done the most with right now. And I wouldn't say that we have <laughs> have drawn a lot of conclusions yet that are going to really help the water treatment industry immediately. We're looking more at the long game of how do we help the industry to minimize biofilm over the long term? And it's a, it's a tough question. Well, the great thing that I get from that question is that you're looking at it and you're working with industry. So we're all coming at it together instead of just pointing fingers. It's your problem. It's your problem. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We take a lot of our research cues from industry. I'm not sure if I mentioned it yet or not, but we get about 40% of our support from industry, either through the dues, the annual dues of our industrial associate members, or through sponsor projects that seek to look at a specific issue around a particular product. And that product might be plumbing fixture. It might be an antimicrobial that is being added into a system. So we tend to, to maintain our relevance that way by asking these questions of industry. What are your biofilm concerns and how can we help? Something I want to thank you for, and I don't know the title of the video, but it shows how biofilm proliferates, how it sloughs off. And I have trained so many water treaters by showing them that film. I, I know there's a dozen probably even more than that, resources uh, that you offer the industry. Do you mind talking a little around that? Yeah, and these are all kind of available on our website. So a lot of these videos offer a great way to visualize what's happening. And, and we, we've got some really cool microscopy capabilities here. A lot of uh, real-time microscopy capabilities, which allow us to, to look at particular clusters of biofilm growing on a surface in real time while they're being exposed to an antimicrobial, for example. And you can see cell death, you can see the removal of the biofilm if it happens, and you can watch why some antimicrobials are more effective than others, again, in real time. And it, I think it really helps people to understand that this biofilm is a, it's, it's a pretty tough adherent and tenacious colony of bacteria that is really difficult to kill. Paul, does your department do anything in developing methods for testing biofilm? Absolutely. We are probably the, the foremost institution in the world for developing biofilm methods. And these are mainly laboratory methods for studying biofilm. And it's important to have standard methods to study biofilms so that labs across the world can give the same answers to the same questions. And we have a, a standard methods laboratory here at the Center for Biofilm Engineering. Uh, it's run by a colleague of mine, Dr. Darla Gores. And Darla is probably the world's foremost expert on developing biofilm methods. Right now we have six ASTM standardized methods. And this is a huge issue. Getting a method standardized through ASTM is kind of the gold standard for biofilms. And it's a very painstaking process to do this. And uh, Darla and her, her team have developed these methods and standardized them, and they're in wide use around the world. And in fact, the EPA has adopted one of the methods that her team developed in their assessment of biofilm efficacy for high-level disinfectants. So if somebody out there were developing a new microbicide, would they contact you to find out these standards? Well, a lot of them are available directly from ASTM. Uh, if, you, if you just go to their website and Google biofilm methods, you'd see many of these methods. And I think what we could help with is to choosing the right method for whatever they're looking to study. And we do these methods routinely in our laboratory as well, testing products for a variety of different companies. And oftentimes what we'll do, because we're so familiar with biofilms and how they grow and the methods that we've developed, we'll take different pieces of different methods and put them together to test something in a unique way, depending on the field application of that chemistry, let's say. And so a lot of the work we do in our labs is more customized work that, that involves taking bits of different methods and looking at them or trying to get an answer that is more relevant to the particular question that's being asked. Your department's done so much to help our industry. What's something our industry can do to help you? <laughs> well, I think 
podcasts like this are really important because it helps me to get the word out about biofilms to different companies that may not have heard of us before. And, you know, the first step is always to come to our website and have a look at what we can offer. And then the next step, if more information is needed, is to contact me. And my email information is uh, available right on the website. So it's, it's really easy to get a hold of me, try to answer every email that I get. And I'm always looking for more industrial contacts so we can both expand our influence and, and help to fund the work that we do, you know, as well as just help U.S. industry become more competitive. I, I would say we're, we're international for sure in our reach, but primarily we work with representatives here in the United States and, and Canada as well. So I asked this question of people that I interview that are in our industry. I'm kind of curious how you're going to answer it. What's one of the oddest things that you've experienced in working with biofilm? Boy, let's see. Uh, okay, here's here's one for you. Let me rephrase and say, what's the strangest place you've seen a biofilm growing? One of the areas that biofilm can grow pretty well is in soap. And we we did a project that looked at the bacterial colonization in reusable soap dispensers. So these are soap dispensers in, in a public restroom that are just refilled with liquid soap whenever they get low on soap. Now, depending on how they're maintained, that also influences the biofilm within it. But the work that we did actually took field samples of these refillable soap dispensers and found that there is a ton of biofilm growing in, in these soap dispensers. So much so that you might be inoculating yourself with 100,000 organisms in a single puff of soap coming out of that dispenser. Really remarkable. And it, and it speaks to how biofilm grows. It grows in a cluster. The cluster tends to detach all at once. And then the biofilm continues to grow wherever it was. But, you know, if, if you happen to, to get a big cluster in that dollop of soap that ended up on your hands, you may be making your hands a little less safe than they were before you, you used it. The answer to this, of course, is that you, you will see many soap dispensers that are not refillable. They have a little packet inside and that when the packet's gone, then, you know, you put a new packet in and, and those are, are totally safe. You know, you wouldn't find biofilm growing in those. Paul, if there are people out there listening and they want to find out more information, what should they do? Yeah, again, our website is a great place to go to, to learn more about what we can offer. Again, I, I really do encourage people to, to contact me directly. Very happy to answer emails or uh, if someone would like to call me, I can, I can certainly speak on the phone as well. And you know, got a biofilm issue, we look to help. That is my job, to interface with uh, industry and to try to help solve biofilm problems. Well, we appreciate you doing that, and we all appreciate you sharing the message on Scaling Up H2O. Well, thank you very much for having me. Scaling Nation, Paul was not exaggerating. He does return emails. I was working on one of my presentations, and I went on their website, just like he urged all of you to do, to get some information so I could better explain what I was trying to explain to my audience. And I thought I wanted to reach out and thank the people that do all of this. I wonder who's involved. I very easily found Paul's information on their webpage and I emailed Paul and I let him know how much I enjoyed what he delivers to our industry. And I invited him on the podcast. I think it was 45 minutes and I got a reply email and he said, I would love to. And then of course you heard the result of that. We're gonna have all the information so you can link directly to the Center for Biofilm Engineering. Lots of great tools on there. And I know you can learn a lot more about something that we have just scratched the surface on in industrial water treatment, which is biofilm. So that's all going to be on our show notes page. Paul, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you for leading the department that does so much for our industry. Nation, there's no doubt about it. Our job is hard. You heard me ask Paul, what do we do when we're trying to save energy? We're trying to save water and we're also trying to keep biofilm at bay. All those things do not go together. 
We've got to work as an industry. We've got to work as a global team to figure out how do we deal with all the things that we need to solve. And by doing something on one end, we don't harm it on the other. And I think that happens a lot when people don't communicate. And Paul shared with me after the interview that he was very appreciative to come on this podcast to let people know that there was a center for biofilm engineering and that we all need to be working together so we're all trying to solve the problem together. We all have little bits and pieces of information that the other one doesn't have. And when we can collaborate with all that information, we can come up with a better solution and we can get further on that solution faster than we ever could by ourselves. I think that's a good way to look at life Anything that you're trying to do, you're going to be able to do it better when you do it with other people. Nation, I absolutely love bringing this podcast to you. I really enjoy every time I go to an event, anything around water treatment, people coming up to me and saying they enjoy the Scaling Up H2O podcast. I think that goes to prove the point. This is a very lonely job where we're driving a lot, we're alone doing testing, doing all the things that we do to make sure that our customers get the best work. And then, of course, we do get to speak with our customers, but it's very easy to become an island. And just like Paul was talking about, we can't fix anything if we are an island don't be an island. There's no reason to be an island. So maybe one of the things I mentioned at the beginning of this episode is something that intrigues you and you can go to one of those conferences. Maybe there's somebody that you think you can help that they're struggling with a particular issue and you think you can help them. Wouldn't that be a great phone call if you receive? So just imagine how they would receive it. Or maybe there's somebody that you need help from and you can call them and ask them for their help. That's a hard phone call to make. And trust me, once you make it, I think you'll be glad that you did. I have never asked anybody in this industry. Well, it's happened very, very rarely where somebody has not reciprocated it and said, how can I help you? What do you need? I want to say that because I do so much for the industry, that helps. But people are just generous with their time in this industry. So don't get in your head too deep that you are not valuable enough for somebody to help you out. People in this industry love to do that. All you need to do is ask. Scaling Up Nation, we have hit the halftime mark. We are right smack dab in the middle of the year. So what have you accomplished this year? What do you want to accomplish? And make sure that each day you're learning from the last day, you're making yourself just a little bit better. Take care, folks. I'll have a brand new episode for you next week. Nation, it's hard to improve the day-to-day -day when we are stuck living in the day-to-day. And for one hour a week, you can join the group at the Rising Tide Mastermind so you can work on the business without being in the business. That one hour will change every other hour of the week. It's magic. It's not magic. It's how we get together. It's how we process issues. It's how we encourage each other. And it's how we just form these common bonds around each other. And there's a camaraderie that I promise you will not find anywhere else. To find out more about the Rising Tide Mastermind, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.